and welcome to this episode of Call Your Broker, where we help to educate business owners, public officials, organization leaders, and consumers on all things insurance and risk management. This is Matthew Strzok of Treadstone Risk Management. Today's episode is something that we'll be doing intermittently. These types of episodes will focus on software, technology, and process improvements for both the public and private sector. The first of these episodes includes an interview with former Village of South Orange president and current Leonia business administrator, Alex Torpy, as well as an overview of a roadway data analysis firm and application provider that they're using, StreetScan. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. I have with me Alex Torpy. Um, Alex is the former village president uh, at the uh, village of South Orange in New Jersey. Um, at the time, I believe you were the youngest elected, uh, basically mayor yeah. um, in New Jersey at the time. And then uh, Alex has uh, since moved um, uh, out of the uh, elected capacity more into an administrative role as the current business administrator in the borough of Leonia in New Jersey. Um, and you're also, you have a background at Seton Hall, right? Uh, you, you were educated in Seton Hall and you also do some teaching work there. Is that right? I did. Yeah. I got my master's actually at John Jay, um, in the city and I've been teaching at Seton Hall for about five years in their MBA program. Okay. Uh, what specifically are you teaching the, uh, molding the young minds uh, there at <laughs> Seton Hall? Uh, the, 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 probably the broadest point is trying to get people to think more critically about um, uh, generally like what an MPA program should prepare people to be able to do. Uh, there are a lot of textbooks that lay out a lot of good foundational knowledge about administratively how things work and different strategies for approaching how to do your budget. And that's all good. And that's all very important. Yep. Um, but you know, if we're all sort of operating under the same framework that exists right now, and that's a framework that uh, a lot of governments are in major financial trouble, including the state of New Jersey and a lot of local governments in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But somehow on the one side, the, local, the governments don't have any money, but also the taxes are too high. If we're operating under the same framework that's produced, uh, you know, a model of governance that's not really working that well and not meeting a lot of our needs, not just in the how expensive it is for the government to exist and perform its functions, but all the other areas that we're not really doing that well. You know, we're not doing transportation and regional transportation networks that well. Uh, we're not doing ed higher education that well. There's all these areas where we're struggling, and yet a lot of the MPA programs um, and a lot of the content, a lot of the way we talk about government to young people is based on doing it the way that got us into this place to begin with. Right. And so trying to think a little more critically uh, learning the foundational knowledge, but then where are the problems with it? What can we do different? And trying to get students to really think really critically in the long term about what their role in a public organization is. You know, is it to solve uh, you know this problem such that a, a political figure can claim a success and run for office, or are we trying to figure out how to rebuild infrastructure in the state and in the country? And is that is that is something that we can talk about and equip young people with? when they go into the public sector. And I think so, so that's what we're, we're trying to get them a little bit more deeply engaged. I, I like that because, uh, you know, being someone who's gotten a handful of designations and letters after my name and whatnot, um, that was always the issue I found was bridging that gap, right? right. The, uh, the ideal case scenario is always the one that's taught in the classroom or that you're answering on the test. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, the the practicality of how to, uh, you know, effectively deploy that information and some of the real world hurdles that you end up facing are obviously completely different than, um, you know, that that traditional kind of education that you might get out of the textbook or um, just in, you know, a seminar kind of format, which is I, I, I love that. So um, that's kind of a good lead into kind of the next point is. Um, you have, I, I wouldn't call it a hundred percent unique, but you definitely have a, a, a very, um, kind of, uh, uh, very kind of impassioned view of, you know, aspects of elected government, municipal government, um, as well as, you know, just service in general. And one of those things, uh, one of the cornerstones of that really centers on technology and its mm -hmm. use within, uh, the government and the public sector. So could you just kind of share your thoughts on just your general philosophy or your perspective on technology as it relates to that, that role in municipal government? Yeah, I, I think technology, I mean, it kind of plays, uh, two different types of roles. One is it is, we're getting to a point where, um, not just understanding technology, but being able to be forward thinking about where technology is going and where different technologies are going, that's become sort of a required component of understanding how every department functions, mm. right? That's one layer. The second layer is that it's also its own discrete entity, 
Um, and so it requires um, a little bit of, I think, a different take than um, than is maybe traditional um, in that every department is going to have a technology component. Um, are you develop? Are you professionally developing staff to be able to understand and engage with those technologies? Are you building uh, a department with you know with staff or with management within your organization that are going to be able to deal with these kind of new technologies as they come up and connect different pieces within a department or connect different services or technologies among departments? Um, you know, if police is using one thing and fire is using another thing, and you know, public works is using another thing. I mean, at some point. You know, these these systems often are very expensive. Um, and whether you're talking about uh, radio systems or you're talking about records retention systems or you're talking about how residents interact with your local government, there's so many different options. And the technology is changing, not understanding the kind of like overall field kind of puts you at a disadvantage. Right. Um, and it puts you at a disadvantage, one, from a strategic planning standpoint. Um, and what might be best to kind of empower your departments to be able to do better. But also it kind of puts you at the whim of, um, uh, you know, the vendors that are out there who all make compelling cases for their products and services. And some of them are making authentic, compelling cases, and some of them might be overselling a little bit. Um, and it's very hard to tell which is which. Right. Um, but they all are good at making the compelling case. So how do you navigate that landscape right. and make the best decisions to bring the technology in that isn't the latest and greatest or isn't the one that won X award, but is the one that is built on meeting your department or your organization's needs that you've identified in a, in a process that is technology agnostic and isn't built on only committing to one software, only committing to one vendor, right. but is built on what the needs of the community are. Yeah, I think uh, that's something that um, as, as someone who is, uh, you know, I, I was kind of uh, brought up in a more kind of like science and math uh, household, mm. um, always had a big appreciation of NASA space travel and exploration, things like that. I always found it interesting that NASA, uh, as, as a semi-government uh, agency, right? Um, they weren't always using the, the the latest and greatest technology because right. it hadn't been proven, right? Um, and so I always kind of use that technology um, or that that example of technology is you don't exactly have the you know you don't have to have the bright shiny thing that just came out um, unless of course there's a really good value proposition that right. goes with it, right? Um, I think that more and more the bright shiny things are beginning to talk with each other, right. which um, you know to kind of allude to your point of all of these like high priced solutions that are in different departments, um, they, you know, a lot of times they cause these silos mm -hmm. um, and data or interactivity or coordination is actually stifled. And so, right. you know, to your point, you're probably better off maybe going with uh, an older model of software or technology, but it might have a little bit more collaborative, um, you know, feature built into it that allows you to coordinate things a little bit better and share data a little, a uh, little bit more. Uh, from your perspective, like the ideal case scenario, with a really good uh, technological, um, you know, structure behind a uh, a governing body or a, or a municipality or a public entity, what's really the biggest pros that come out of that uh, that setup, out of that um, kind of framework, if you would? Um, there's probably a couple. I mean, one is that if you're if you're able to be kind of critical and um, and uh, I don't know, it may be independent or objective is the word I'm going for and, mm -hmm. and navigating like different technology tools, you can save a lot of money. Yeah, um, that's that's the first one. And that's, you know, as, as an administrator, that's usually the first thing that's on my mind. Yeah. Right. Is what are the costs? Yes. Um, and let's look at both sides of it. And, you know, there are a lot of different areas where technology is generating revenue and could maybe generate more revenue or could make things easier for uh, community members such that they, you know, I mean, if, if, if it's difficult for someone to develop a property because the permitting process is complicated and requires a lot of paperwork and you have to keep stopping in and all these, if we could actually create, could you create more economic activity by streamlining the process? I think the answer is yes. And I think a lot of places, you see that on the revenue side and you see it on the cost side, mm -hmm. you know, we have had slash have a very complex uh, kind of internet telecom setup um, in our um, facilities here. Um, and it is, uh, you know, an enterprise level solution that is well beyond what we need. Mm, yes. Um, and it just, it, it's not, it doesn't match. Right. Um, and so there are solutions out there that do, and they're significantly less expensive. Um, but the only way to kind of arrive at that, at that realization is going through the process of understanding your own needs, 
without being blind to whatever the technology is, mm -hmm. you may do your needs assessment and come out and realize that there is no technology that meets your needs. Right, right. But that's OK, because you know where you stand. And now when you make compromises, if you need to, you're at least aware of that. And it's intentional. And you can sit with your stakeholders and say, well, here are the needs that we've identified with this department. There is no vendor out there that meets these three high prioritized needs that we have. But there's one that meets most of them. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, and, and, and that's the we're all going to agree that we're going to sacrifice, uh, you know, X versus Y, because that's that's what we think is the best move. Right. And so it allows you to see that. I think that's one of the biggest pros. And the second um, and there's there's many, but maybe the second most important is that a lot of people like to um, a lot of people want to make data driven decisions. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to at least have data available when they make decisions. Um, but data is uh, difficult. You have to go get it. You have to compile it. You have to analyze it. You have to apply it in the way that's uh, uh, appropriate based on what, you know, how statistically significant the data is and how you collected it and what the implications are and what conclusions you can draw from it. Right. And that's, you know, that process is much more formal and much more uh, comprehensive um, than the way that a lot of people approach decision making, especially in the political world, but really in any world, people tend to make decisions based on their, you know, immediate reactions to things. They tend to make decisions based on past experiences that are sort of amorphous in nature. You know, they remember yeah. something working one way or not working. Or they remember they had a conversation with someone who said, "Oh, that's not a good song," but yeah. that's not really objective enough, right? That's or not emotional. Enough. Yeah, emotional. yeah, very yeah. emotional. Yeah. And so, the technology allows you to reduce the cost of collecting data, yeah. um, and it allows you to reduce the cost of evaluating that data and drawing potentially conclusions from it. So, it can be, if it's used the right way, it can be a tremendous help in allowing you um, access to information mm -hmm. that you can use to make better decisions. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of my favorite uh, podcasts that I listen to. Um, is Freakonomics Radio. Um, just this idea of taking this, these masses amount of data um, or you know, data points and analyzing them and seeing what the actual conclusion that you should draw is. Right. Um, a lot of times you find out that it's not 100% one way or the other. Right. It's 90% you know, of the time this works. Um, but just some of the crazy stuff that come, come out of that. Uh, would you say that uh, availability of data um, also makes municipal government or uh, administering a publicly funded agency um, a, a little bit easier to be transparent or at the very least kind of justified decision making to the stakeholders? It does. I mean, there has to be a will uh, to do it still. Um, and sometimes it, it, you know, it's like anything. I mean, it's a, it's just, it's a strategy that is going to be done over, you know, multi weeks, months, years to really get to um, uh, you know, a real successful like metric point with something like that. But absolutely. I mean, the kinds of things um, that that you can put out there that, you know, community members, people in the news, uh, other stakeholders can engage with, uh, you know, that's one of that's probably one of the best functions of government over the last decade is making data available without even any purpose mm. and just making it available. I mean, Google Maps, that's how Google Maps, I mean, who can imagine living and navigating without Google Maps anymore? Yeah, no, I'd be lost. Right. <laughs> but that's Google. It's Google. It's a private company, but it was built originally on public transit data. Right. Um, and government has that data because they're operating the systems. Should government create the app? I don't think so. Right. Google did a pretty good job with that. Let the private companies do that. Mm -hmm. But government has this really potentially valuable role in saying, well, we have all this data here. Do something with it. Yeah. And who knows? And a lot of scientific advancement is done that same way. Yep. Right? People don't always know what they're going to get out of what they're working on. Right, right. But sometimes in government, it's difficult to do things without having a purpose. Right. right. Sometimes everything has to be It's almost more bottom line than a corporation in a sense. Right. Everything has to be for a justifiable reason. There's not a lot of room for experimentation. Right, right. Um, but it, but if the will is there to do that, um, you know, the benefits can really be extraordinary. Awesome. OK, so uh, I, I mean, uh, hopefully we're going to have you back for a number more of these. Um, but the, the real impotence of this uh, impetus of this recording um, in this episode is really to kind of get to know your background a little bit and your perspective but also specifically to talk about a, uh, a piece of technology that I believe you've recently implemented mm -hmm. here in Leonia. Um, the, the technology or the app name is StreetScan. Um, that's S-T-R-E-E-T. 
S-C-A-N, um, and just kind of talk about it. What, what's really the, the, the mechanism and what, what does it provide to the borough? Um, and then ultimately, you know, how does it work and what, what are the advantages that it brings to the table? For sure. Um, so basically what StreetScan is, is a, um, a, a data collection uh, company for infrastructure assets. Um, and um, to give a little bit of context, right, there's really kind of three ways that you can, and we'll just come down to street level. Mm-hmm. That the, the main purpose of this is for um, right now that we're using it for, and there's a couple others that are going to come down the line, is for determining how to do the road resurfacing, right, is to identify and evaluate and rank the, um, the order of the streets that we should be going in based on engineering data, based on cost, um, and based on uh, impact with traffic volume. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's really three ways that you can come to that decision. And, and there's, you know, all towns cover some wide range of this, right? One is kind of the uh, ad hoc, like political decision making, which is basically roads get done in whatever order the political stakeholders want the roads to get done in. Right, right. Right. And that is, so you the, know, so, all, the, so the council members road gets done. That's right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, or if they don't get along, they might, the road, his road might get done last. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, but that's basically it, right. Is, is there's not really a framework for the decision making. I'm not suggesting that all people who do it that way are doing something nefarious, but there's not there's not an objective framework in place. Right, right. Right. They're going based on their own observations or what they and like we just discussed, those observations are probably not going to be as comprehensive and accurate as people think. Um, so that's one way that places do it. Um, and it tends to respond to public pressure and what people personally notice. The other way is having uh, people evaluate the roads. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are usually done by uh, public works departments or engineering teams or consultants that come out. Um, and they have a scoring criteria. There's a couple standardized ones, PCI pavement condition index, which is a zero to hundred scale is one of the more common ones. Um, but there's a couple different formats that people use and they come out and they take a look at the roads and they have inspectors come out and they look at, uh, you know, potholes and alligator cracking and all these different things and look at, uh, you know, what they would estimate the cost of the repair to be, you know, put together and say, here's, you know, A through F, let's say, the condition of the roads, and that's the order that we're going to go in, um, which is pretty good. Right. Um, but there is technology out there that allows you to do a step better. Yeah. And so that's what Street Scan does is what they have is they come out and they bring like a, um, you know, it's like a van that has a 3D can has a whole like, array of sensors and cameras all around it mm-hmm. facing uh, on the ground in a couple different directions. Uh, there's radar sensors. There's 3D cameras. I think they still use a microphone, there's a couple other sensors, and they compile all that data. The van is filled with servers, it's incredible, really. <laughs> and it's like and it's like compiling all that, and it's, it's taking video and photos of all of your road surface, yep. and then analyze, and running, it takes like a couple days, it runs through like a program, and it spits out a zero to 100 scale for all of your blocks in your, in your town. Mm-hmm. And you provide traffic volume data, approximations and you provide estimated cost to repair for different types of repairs. Mm -hmm. And then they run all that together and show you what your condition of all of your roads are, what it would cost to fix each of them and what their kind of estimate, what they, what they believe the priority is based on how bad the roads are one, uh, the cost to repair two and the traffic volume three. Okay. And what that allows us to do is ensure that where we are putting our money for the road resurfacing is going in the right places, right? We, we are not going to not be the most efficient with the way that we spend this money, right? It allows us to build a long-term capital plan. It allows us to have video HD uh, video and photos of all of our road surfaces, Mm -hmm. um, which is really helpful um, as well. We have a map that has all of our manholes and all the roads identified and um, there's this data now that we have access to that we can use for other things too. And so uh, speaking from a risk management perspective, um, a, a big thing that we have in New Jersey, um, and this isn't uh, completely you know, isolated to New Jersey, a number of other states have um, these sovereign immunity laws, right? Um, and so those sovereign immunity laws apply to whatever premises are maintained by the local municipality or the camp county or state government. Um, and so specific to roads, uh, you have claims of, you know, individuals that have, um, you know, either had their vehicles damaged mm-hmm. or gotten to an accident. Um, and the, the allegation or concern is that the condition of the road, uh, was such and such on, on, on a date. Um, this actually kind of goes to that, right? This, this kind of goes to the, um, municipality, at least, uh, triaging, which roads are supposed to be, uh, resurfaced or fixed, 
um, accounting for what the quality of road the road was at least at a certain point in time, mm -hmm. uh, and then also you know creating that dialogue about all right this is the way that we're um, prioritizing how we go through this process. And so in a lot of states that sovereign immunity um, has certain aspects to it. And so you know prioritizing which projects get done first it can be a big component of that which I, I love out of this technological solution. Um, let's just kind of talk about like how things were done back in the middle ages of, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, so what street scans doing is essentially what would have been done by a, a team or a handful of individuals in terms of scoring, um, these, these roadways, uh, would you say that this process is dramatically faster than the way it used to happen, um, with, you know, the engineering department or, um, you know, an outside contractor coming in to have handful of people kind of look at the roadways? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple big differences in the process. Um, and at least for us, I mean, we had uh, engineering reports that had been produced in the past. This is less expensive than those. Mm -hmm. um, and what we had in the past was, uh, you know, a chart that ranked all the different roads and showed kind of the detail from the inspections. But it was, um, you know, a paper document. What this produces is in a GIS system in ESRI, um, and it shows us all these assets, they're all marked in such a way that if we use other GIS systems in the future, all this is compatible with each other, right? If I wanna overlay traffic accident data at some point, well, that might be interesting to compare to the condition of the roads. Yep, yep. Um, and there's all these different things that we could potentially do with that now that that data is in a machine readable format and, and, and online, so we can access it, uh, my police chief can access it, uh, folks, I mean, we, we have we can actually make it available to the public, too. Mm -hmm. And so any member of the public and that's one of the things that's really important about this is that this is one of the kinds of things um, there are. There are two um, there are two kind of driving goals. These are pretty basic, but I think they actually capture a lot of like the kind of programs that I think are the right ones to do. And it one should be trusted and it two should be effective. Right. And almost everything good falls under, if you can do both of those. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're going to capture a lot. Yeah, the middle of the Venn diagram. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. And, um, and the trusted part is really important because people often don't trust government. And I think that in 2018, no matter where you are in the country, no matter what level of government you're talking about, no matter what the demographic of the audience that you're talking about is, people don't really trust the government to do things well right now. Right, right, right. Um, and everybody's kind of frustrated and angry and they don't really understand why the taxes are you know, higher than they think they should be, but services aren't being done in the right way. Like it doesn't make sense to anybody and everybody's kind of frustrated about this. And what this helps do, I think, is build some of that trust back because we're not saying, oh, you can't know how we decide the roads, or right. we're also not saying you can't influence it, right. right? You can't influence it because that's not, that's really not, unless we made a mistake in the calculation or we missed a road, right? And we would want that issue brought to our attention, but we're making a calculation that is basically as objective as anyone seems to understand how that it can be. Right. And so if your road isn't getting done, and I had a lot of these conversations more when I was um, in office in South Orange, People would come in and they're frustrated about their roads and everybody's opinion is that their road is the worst. Right. Right. And people would show pictures and people show me pictures of their kid who fell off their bike. And it's hard not to be compelled by that. Right. Right. I'm sorry that I see your kid fell like that. It's terrible. But, but they're in a fishbowl, right? They're not going yeah. to review every. No, they haven't test. done the evaluation. They don't yeah. know what it costs to fix what roads. They don't know the traffic. About, like, but that's the stuff. If we want government to be trusted, we can't just give resources to people who demand it. Right. Right. Because that tends to give resources to certain demographics of people over others. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it is a non-objective, non-systems way to deal with problems. It's completely reactive mm -hmm. and people know that. And so people tend to, you know, everybody knows the uh, squeaky um, wheel gets the grease, right? right? Everybody's, everybody's familiar with that concept. And most of us, you know, if we're frustrated, we will put that pressure on the government mm -hmm. to do something about it because our perception is that's the only way things get done. Right. But that's a bad perception. That needs to be gone out of the way people think government works. Right, right. And and in terms of providing them with data and providing them with some insight into the decision making process, I, I think a, a, a lot of um, municipal government um, and even, you know, county and state level and even especially the federal level. Um, they kind of shy, shy away from that, right? They're, right. they're worried about um, losing momentum in terms of different initiatives. Um, but uh, I, I, I like the, the idea and I like the practicality of using technology to develop that justification, right? right. Um, to, to essentially put a, 
a, a line of logic of how we got from point A to point B, because then you, like you said, that kind of neutralizes that argument of, oh, you're just doing this out of self-interest right, or, right. you know, you have some ulterior nefarious motive um, that's coming out of this when you say, look, you know, the numbers are the numbers. Um, we analyze it like such, and, and this is the conclusion we drew. So. And I think I think people appreciate. I think they appreciate seeing things that are done in a systems way, right? Because I mean, I've talked to people whose roads didn't get done, but explain the process of doing it, and they're like, "Oh, that sounds pretty good." Yeah, it's kind of hard to argue with that. And you're like, sure, we can't get everything done for everybody, but that's always the case, mm-hmm. right? And people who are in the public, the taxpayers, they're already paying the taxes. They shouldn't have to ask us for services, right? 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 They shouldn't have to come to council meetings and demand things. They shouldn't have to write letters in. It's our job to provide these things, and we should be take on all of the responsibility of providing them better than we're doing right now. Right. And, and people should sit at home and say, wow, things are going really well today. I pay my taxes and I vote and I get as involved as I want to be, but I don't need to go lobby my government for my road to be safe. Right. Well, and uh, it's also the uh, the industry of managing expectations, right? Right. right. Um, so if you are in the dark about what's going to happen, obviously you're going to draw irrational conclusions or you're going to get overly agitated. Yeah. But, you know, if... If you use street scan and you go out and you say, all right, well, the roadway that you're on is, you know, maybe second tier on the priority list. Um, we expect to get to that road within this time frame. I think that kind of neutralizes right. a lot of that, uh, you know, a lot of that just misinformation and people kind of flying off the handle because they feel like they're not being updated enough That's on, right. on when right. things are being taken care of. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, fantastic. So, um, th- this was an awesome interview. Thank you very much. Sure. Like I said, I, I, I want to, I want to definitely make this, you know, uh, a recurring, I don't know how frequently, but you know, obviously, uh, you have work to do, but, um, <laughs> you know, a recurring, uh, kind of situation. Uh, the one thing I'll ask you about, uh, at the end here and, uh, throw a little bit of a curveball, but I love to ask people this, um, what are you listening to or reading currently? Um, that's kind of, you know, um, and it could be anything. I mean, it could be fiction or it could be, you know, like you said, one of the, uh, you know, various municipal management models, uh, right. manuals that are out there. Yeah. So uh, what do you kind of either have rolling on your podcast or you've read recently? Well, I'll give you uh, I'll give you two real quick. So one is um, I mean, I'm reading the municipal management manuals, too, but yep. those aren't quite as exciting. Sure. Um, the two things that are uh, really on the front of my mind um, that I'm reading and listening to, one is a book called Snow Crash. Okay. It's a science fiction, uh, Neil Stevenson. It's unbelievably brilliant. Um, and it, uh, very unique. It's a bit of a like, steampunk genre. Okay. Um, and he's a, a, a exceptional writer and he writes a lot of science fiction and it's a, it's a little bit of a, a silly critical take on kind of everything you read it and you're like, yeah, this is absurd, but also amazing. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the one side of it, the sort of fictional side. Yeah. And this particular science fiction is, is very fictional in that way. Um, or a little bizarre, I guess. And then the other is I have been completely on with, um, uh, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, and astrophysics and astronomy in general. That's a good one. So I'm going through book I'm reading. I finished one of his books a couple weeks ago. I'm reading uh, Kip Thorne's book about, um, uh, you seen the movie Interstellar? Yep. yep. And I didn't realize, I knew Interstellar was meant to be scientific, mm-hmm. like they were trying to be accurate. I did not realize uh, until a couple weeks ago, one of my uh, buddies told me about this. I did not realize that they brought in Kip Thorne, who is a Nobel Prize, one of the preeminent physicists in the world, mm-hmm. um, to dictate basically in the movie what is scientific and make sure that everything is scientific. That's awesome. And yeah. so some of the things in there and and so the book catalogs the start to finish making of the movie from this physicist's perspective. Mm-hmm. And um, and he is, you know, the, the conversations that he was having with the directors and all these people like, no, that and like what can work. And basically everything in the movie um, is, is, is possible from a scientific perspective. Mm-hmm. And it's the most accurate rendering of a black hole ever produced by anyone. Awesome. And so what's funny about it is reading from the physicist perspective, right? They've got all the talk about data, right? I mean, this yeah. is like data to a degree that I can't even like imagine. This is like the Goodwill hunting chalkboard data. Yes. Yep, yep. Um, and that is, and, and so they're, you know, in their labs, they're in you know, research universities working on this stuff, but you know, the budgets in those places are tight, right? And their visualization capacity is, is limited. Now you've got a giant Hollywood movie with a very large graphics budget coming out. Yeah. And what was really interesting was seeing, and, and I imagine this must've been thrilling for the physicists um, and probably for the graphic team too, but pl- what they did, the way they designed the graphics in that movie 
was built on the models that this physicist uses in the lab. Yep. So they, the graphics are beautiful, but they, but that basically they took the data and the visualizations they have and, you know, put, you know, however many millions of dollars went into those producing those graphics. And people were like, this is probably what this looks like. That's awesome. Like, and no one has ever seen it like that before. Cause no one's really had that kind of money to create something like that. Oh yeah. And that's, that's the one thing I like about, uh, like anything that has to do with, you know, science fiction or when, when they actually include as much, you know, actual, uh, you know, actuality in it as right, possible. Right. Agreed. I, I love that. I mean, you know, um, and, and it's been, a re, re, it's been a while since I've read it, but if you haven't read it already, um, it, it kind of maybe takes a step back from what you've, you've been reading currently, but, um, Michio Kaku, um, mm-hmm. wrote a book called, I believe it's called Hyperbridge. Um, and it's about talking about Einstein Rosen bridges, uh, and time travel and kind of some of the strange things that happen as a result of the math hmm. associated with, um, very strange things that do things. happen. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like the idea that you can't necessarily change the past because you'll kind of block yourself, um, <laughs> is a really interesting concept. But so anyway, I digress. Um, Alex, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. and, um, you know, best of luck here thank in, you. in Leonia. And uh, we'll we'll definitely uh, do another one of these in the future. So we Great. appreciate it. Let me know anytime. All right. Thanks, Sam. And that's a wrap. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Call Your Broker. We hope you got something out of it. If you did, please, please, please hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment or a review. If you have specific questions, you can always reach out to us directly at either treadstonerisk.com or lbanj.com. We'll see you next time. And as always, this is a reminder to call your broker. We'll take the night.